All right, it's 5 o'clock, so I'm going to get started. Thanks for uh, coming out. I'm going to be talking about a tool I developed called Icebreaker. Uh, it's a pretty dope tool, I'm not going to lie. It's great for getting a foothold on Active Directory domains. So the use case for this tool is going to be when you have a Dropbox on the internal network and you need access to the Active Directory environment, but you don't have credentials, you don't have uh, anything to enter that Active Directory environment with. So Icebreaker will give you credentials. Just by being on the same internal network, it'll do it all automatically with one command. I'm Dan McInerney, I'm a senior pen tester with Coalfire. I'm going to give Coalfire a big shout out here because they paid for months of my development time on this, which is awesome. I'm part of the Coalfire Labs R&D team, which is headed up by Red Team legend Ryan Jones and tool master Marcello Salvati, who wrote Crack Map Exec and Death Star and some other stuff that we all use every day. Uh, I love those people, and I'm really happy to be part of their team. Uh, that's my GitHub, that's my Twitter. Um, I really only tweet about like my tools and stuff, so it's kind of boring. Uh, so let me give you a little uh, overview here. You have, say, a Kali box on an internal network, um, or any kind of Linux box, really. Uh, what this is going to do is perform five different attacks automatically. These five attacks will be executed with the goal of getting either plain text credentials or NTLM hashes. Uh, whenever it gets net NTLM hashes, it will attempt to crack those hashes automatically using John the Ripper and a custom word list. The custom word list I'm using comes from Seclist's GitHub. I downloaded all 32 million passwords on the Seclist's GitHub, and then I narrowed that list down to uh, default Active Directory passable passwords. So, for instance, I got rid of all of the passwords that are all numbers, I got rid of all the passwords that are all uppercase, all the passwords that are all lowercase, because by default, Active Directory enforces a seven character minimum with uh, three out of five of the rules being uppercase, lowercase, symbol, number, so on and so forth. So essentially, I just narrowed that 32 million password list down to Active Directory specific of one million passwords. So password cracking goes very quickly, and it also saves all the hashes just in case it doesn't actually automatically crack them. Uh, you can just crack them uh, on your own cracker machine if you wanted to do that. So here are the five attacks it's going to do. We're going to do RID cycling and a reverse brute force, SCF file upload. Uh, SCF actually stands for shell command file, so I'm not really sure. I always keep saying SCF file. I'm, I'm probably going to say it again. Uh, it's like hey, saying ATM machine, but whatever. SCF file upload, uh, LLMNR, MBTNS, and MDNS poisoning, which is highly effective. Net NTLM version 2 relaying using the impacket library, which uh, is my favorite attack. And then IP version 6 DNS poisoning. This is the newest attack that it includes using a tool called MITM6 from Fox IT, or maybe it's Foxit. Again, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, but that's a really cool tool that does some really neat, uh, like complex attacks to get network hashes from people on the Active Directory environment. It's pretty easy to set up. You're going to want to just git clone it. Uh, then you just cd into the folder that you just git cloned. You're going to run the setup script. And then you're going to do pip env install dash dash three, which creates a virtual environment for Python. And then pip env shell to enter the virtual environment. And finally, you can just run it as simply as this, icebreaker.py dash l targets. Dash l is list of targets. So that's going to be a list of IP addresses or uh, CIDR notations, things like that. You can also give it an XML file. So if you want to do the nmap yourself, then you can do the nmap, save the output as an XML file, and then give it the dash X, and then the path to the XML file that you just uh, scanned it with. Uh, it will do the nmap by itself if you want it to. So it could save you a little bit of time, um, but you know it'll be more customizable if you do the nmap yourself. I really like to do a Docker of this because it takes a while to install. If you have a, if you're on a system that has low resources, I mean, it can take like an hour to install because it's compiling John uh, and some other stuff. So if anybody knows anything more about Docker than I do, I'll give you 20 bucks to make a Docker file. Uh, he, so largely, the script is just glue between known attacks. This is not a novel. Uh, there's no novel attacks in this tool. I'm just taking all of the best network attacks for getting Active Directory credentials when you don't have access to the Active Directory environment whatsoever, and I glued them together a bit. So this is, uh, the Python East does in here are going to look at this and be like, what, you're just using subprocess for all this. Yes, subprocess is the core, because I'm calling other tools, but uh, there's quite a bit of complexity that went into this based on my personal experiences as a pen tester for three years of Fortune 500 companies, what works the best, 
uh, how to automate the whole process. So it's like 1,500 lines of code or 1,600 lines of code or something. So although this is the core, uh, it's not just calling subprocess alone. It also has some async features. Um, async features specifically to speed up the reverse brute force, which I'll talk about in just a second. So attack number one. The way this script works is we're going to have it do the fast attacks first, and then it will just linger infinitely on the long attacks that you can just wait for uh, people to send you their credentials. Uh, so this is going to be the fastest attack. It's going to be rid cycling into reverse brute force. The difference between a brute force and reverse brute force is that a reverse brute force is going to take a short list of usernames, oh, I'm sorry, a long list of usernames and a short list of passwords. The reason we're doing that is that we don't get account lockouts. So if there's a null session, a null SMB session, meaning an SMB session that a computer can connect, connect to another computer using just a blank username and password, if we have that, we can do an attack called rid cycling. Now, every account in an Active Directory domain is going to have a SID, a security identifier. The SID's a big, long number. The RID are the last numbers after the dash of the SID. So what you can do is cycle the RID number, because you start at 1,000, because that's when all regular users start at. A uh, regular user is going to be like a big, long number, dash 1,000. That'll be the first domain user. Second domain user will be dash 1,001. So what you can do is you can connect over SMB, and you can cycle those RID numbers to get actual usernames out of them. Then you take that list of valid usernames, and you pass it to another computer, and you try various passwords in order to brute force. So this is going to be an, uh, a fast and dumb attack. Nothing too uh, extraordinary here. But it will be asynchronous. I added some asynchronousity. Asynchronous, for those who don't know, is when you want to do concurrent programming. Python has had a problem with concurrent programming since its inception because it has something called the gill. The gill prevents you from truly having a threaded program. At any given time, you'll only be using uh, or interacting with a single thread. So they have, they have the threading as a library, but um, there's a lot of problems with it. So what Python did was move to asynchronousity, where there's a, a little event loop. It spins in a circle, and whenever something happens, it reacts to whatever just happened. And if nothing's happening in this event over here, it just keeps on going. Uh, so I have asynchronously testing uh, all the past the usernames that you can get out of an, a null SMB session. We find the null SMB session through Nmap, and then we pass it these two passwords. I chose these two passwords specifically because they are the most common passwords I see in Active Directory environments uh, over my past three years. I see them all the time. If you have a list of 50 to maybe 75 usernames, one of these passwords will pop one of those usernames. We've got password with an at and a zero, and we've got spring 2018 or summer 2018. The script is smart enough to recognize what season it is, and so it'll automatically update this password uh, as the season change. The reason this is so common is because there's a ton of Active Directory corporations and uh, um, group policy that says you have to change your password every three months. So humans being lazy, they'll be like, oh, all right, well, spring 2018. And then when they have to change it in three more months, they'll be like, all right, well, and now it's summer 2018. So we'll change it to that. Uh, so this is highly, highly effective for these two passwords. Uh, you can add other passwords to the brute force if you want. You can feed the script a list. There's an option for that. Uh, I generally don't, just because there's no need to. This captures an enormous amount of them. So in addition to the uh, RID cycling to get usernames, we can also use the harvester for usernames. So a lot of corporations will have an email address like dmcinerney at coalfire.com. So if you can scrape their website for uh, email addresses, you can just take the first half of that email address and use that as a valid Active Directory uh, username. So you can also pass it the harvester, which will scrape it for more usernames. You'll get a nice long list of usernames that you then reverse brute force with these two, and you'll uh, very surprisingly catch a lot of people with these two passwords. This is what it looks like in practice. Uh, you'll see it says the domain was found, null session found, so now we're doing uh, RPC client, uh, I'm sorry, RID enum, to do the actual uh, RID cycling, and we found some passwords. We've got Steve and Bob. Attack two. So attack one is just going to take a few minutes. We're going to be done with that. Now we're going to move on to attack two. SCF file upload. SCF files are a strange thing in the Microsoft world. They're called shell command files. Uh, I don't really understand why they exist. Um, I'm happy they do. But basically, they're supposed to be used for doing simple explorer actions or something. Like, like you double-click an SCF file, 
and you can open up Explorer to a, I don't know, a share or something. I don't really get it. I don't really care. Uh, what I do care about is the fact that it will send your hash to me via an SCF file. So what the script does is use an NMAP, uh, NSC script, identifies all the anonymously writable shares on the network. Now, granted, this is not super common, but if you have a large enough organization, uh, there will be some anonymously writable shares. Uh, once it finds an anonymously writable share, such as Windows 10 slash pictures, it will create an SCF file with an icon that points to the attacker's machine. Now, what's crazy about this is that when a user opens this share, Windows 10 pictures, without even opening the SCF file or interacting with the SCF file in any way, shape, or form, their hash is sent to you. The net NTLM version 2 hash of their account for Active Directory is sent to you. They don't even have to know this SCF file exists. They don't have to double click it. They have to do nothing. All they have to do is open up the share and their password sent to you. This was patched in Windows 10, not patched in prior versions. Uh, so if you've done any pen testing recently, uh, you'll notice that Windows 7 is the most common operating system. Uh, Windows XP still has a huge market share, but it doesn't really matter that this was patched in Windows 10 just because somebody's going to have Windows 7 or Windows 8. They're going to double click on that share and you're going to have the password. Uh, you're going to get the hash, and then it'll automatically crack the hash, like I said earlier. This is what it looks like. It's super simple. We've got shell, command two, I don't even know what that does. Icon file equals. That's what matters. That's the important part. That's my attacking machine right there. I, file that ICO doesn't even have to exist. Like, I don't even get it. I, I don't get anything about this, this uh, file or why it exists, but I don't have to. You just upload that to the anonymous threadable shares, and whenever someone connects, you get the password. You do have to be running Respondor or some sort of um, multicast or broadcast-based poisoner in order to capture their hash. But uh, this tool already does that, so you don't have to worry about that. This is what it looks like in practice. So it'll find the writable shares. Uh, it'll say attempting to write. It'll then run SMB client to write the file. Uh, it keeps a log of all of this, too. So if uh, there's the option to delete these files after you hit Control-C on, on the program. Um, and then it also, after it writes the file, sometimes you'll get a false positive and it'll say successfully wrote. It then checks to make sure that the file's actually there. So it goes out and then does a list of that uh, file share and makes sure that the SCF file is, is actually written there. So attack number three. Attack one went fast. Attack two going to be really fast as well. Attack number three is going to be uh, a complex name, but a pretty simple attack. LMNR, NVTNS, MDNS poisoning. What all of these are, are multicast or broadcast-based protocols. What that means is it's sending out a message to either some or all of the local subnet or a layer two, which will usually be the subnet. What these protocols do is essentially identical to DNS. It's just mapping an IP address to a host name. Uh, and like DNS, it implicitly trusts responses. Uh, unlike a DNS, there's nothing like a TXID field in, in LMNR and MPTNS and MDNS, which means that poisoning it is just silly easy. So I'm going to use a tool called Responder by Laurent Gaffey. Um, I don't know if he's actually French, but I like to pronounce it like it's French because it looks like it. Uh, I think he'd be okay with that. So because it implicitly trusts responses, you can just run Responder and then whenever a computer, I think I have a diagram here, whenever a computer sends out, hey, uh, I'm looking for the Google host, we'll say slash slash Google, uh, DNS is going to be number one. Uh, if DNS can't find it, then it falls back to LLMNR, MDTNS, or MDNS. Most of the time it's LLMNR. Uh, once it falls back, it sends out a blast of packets saying, hey, where is Google? DNS can't help me. Where is this host named Google? And then what you do as responder is say, I'm Google, you know, connect to me, that's great. And then they say, oh, okay, cool. And they pass you their net NTLM version 2 hash. Uh, you, that's quite nice of them. Uh, it's also quite an easy attack to perform because all you do is run responder. So what this is just going to do is just run responder, and it's only going to run responder for 10 minutes because you'll catch pretty much the same passwords, hashes, when you run responder alone as when you run it in conjunction with the next attack, which is NTLM relay. Uh, most of the time, I skip attack three specifically for that reason. I'll just move on straight to attack four. One thing I didn't mention is you can skip any part of these attacks. You can skip the LNMR poisoning, the SCF file upload, the 
uh, the RP, the RID. So a lot of my friends like to just use this script solely for the NTLM relay. So they skip everything except attack four and five, uh, which is fine. I mean, that's what I built it for. Here's what it looks like in practice. This is the NTLM version two hash right here. We get it from the username Bob, domain lab, uh, and then this is the actual hash. Uh, so we'll say, it'll say hash found, and then it'll say running John the Ripper. So John the Ripper will run uh, a max of 10 processes at a time, and it'll just do a quick little uh, word list uh, and rule-based uh, attack there. Now, it says password found, lab Bob password. You'll notice that didn't come from responder. This is all you get from responder. That password found came from uh, the John cracking the NetNTLM version 2 password. Oh, it's nice to respond to that it actually skips previously captured hashes. Um, I don't know, small detail. Uh, oh yeah, one last thing on this one is all of these hashes are stored in the hashes folder. Every time it gets a net NTL on hash, it stores it in the hashes folder. It's pretty easy just to concatenate all those hashes if you want into one file and then send it off to your cracker box uh, if the one million password list uh, fails you. Attack number four. Uh, this is probably my favorite one. Attack number four is NTLM relay. So SMB relay is a very old attack. We've known about it since I think like 2001 or something. Uh, it's a man in the middle attack. It's SMB. SMB is the method of file sharing essentially between Windows computers to oversimplify it. Uh, so two computers can connect to each other over SMB and they can trade files and they can, you know, read system information and stuff like that. It's over port 445. Uh, so this script is going to use the Impacket library, which is an incredible library written by Alberto Salino. Somehow one dude just maintains this whole library. He's, he's a superhuman. But he's got a tool called NTLM Relay X, which is probably the easiest way of doing NTLM Relay. Um, NTLM Relay is necessary because net NTLM hashes are different than NTLM hashes. NTLM hashes are the hashes that are stored in the SAM database of the Windows computer. You can pass NTLM hashes as if they were just a plain text password. So those are fantastic. Net NTLM is a handshake based protocol, which means you can't just pass that hash we saw on the last slide to another computer and have it authenticate for you because it's going to be a different hash every time you use it. So what NTLM relay does is it relays the hash instead of passing the hash. So you can be right in the middle of the connection. Uh, the hash will be sent to you and you just pass it right on to the next computer, and the next computer that you're trying to run X, uh, commands on will say, yes, that works fine. What would you like me to do? And you say, you drop what the victim wants it to do, and you give it what you want it to do. Uh, one caveat is SMB signing has to be disabled. SMB signing is when you sign the SMB connection so that you can't um, jump in the middle of it. It'll break the connection. That was... SMB signing being disabled has been default since, I want to say like Windows 7. I think the latest versions of Windows 10 now have it enabled by default. I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, but there's an, a very valid reason to disable SMB signing, which is what many to most system administrators do. And that's because it's a 15% network latency increase. So there is a very valid reason for not having SMB signing enabled. And it's also disabled by default for all older versions of Windows. Uh, you also have to have SMB version 1 enabled. Um, that's also default. I think the latest versions of Windows 10 probably take that out. But uh, if you're running a network, then there is an excellent chance you're going to have SMB version 1 open because of backwards compatibility issues, and you're going to have SMB signing disabled for the speed of it. So those are not, those are caveats, but they're caveats that I rarely encounter in the wild. Vast majority of the time, I see both SMB version 1 enabled and SMB signing disabled. Uh, Alberto Salino is working on a release for NTLM Relay that will work with SMB version 2. So that's nice of him. Um, but it's not really that important. So let's talk about the differences between the NTLM hash and the net NTLM hash. That's an NTLM hash. That's a net NTLM hash. This hash will change every time that computer makes a connection to another computer. That hash will not change, because that's just the, had the MD4 hash of... of uh, their actual Active Directory password. This is what gets sent when SMB connections are being made. And that's where you're going to capture most of the password hashes, is when SMB connections are being made across the network and you're poisoning them. Remember, these can be passed just like a password. These cannot. Uh, so you can see the 
The username is the admin, the domain is the lab, uh, the challenge is 08CA, blah, blah. The LM hash, uh, LM is the old version of how Windows hashed passwords. I literally, in three years, have not encountered an organization that still allowed LM hashes. Uh, when, so I wouldn't really worry about that for now. Uh, the NTLM hash is the actual final part of it. Starts at that five right there and moves on down. That's the MD4 uh, hash of their Active Directory password with some with the challenge mixed in and some other stuff too, so it changes every time. So here's the current state of passing the hash versus relaying. Relaying the hash, again, can be done through SMB connections and network connections and network shares. The computer sends the net NTLM hash, and you can relay that, but you can't pass it. Passing it is using the NTLM hash as like a password. So you can collect NTLM hashes through tools such as Metasploit's hash dump. Uh, so if you have an administrative console on any computer, you can dump the SAM database. There's a PowerShell tool called Invoke Power Dump, great name, that you can also use to dump the NTLM hashes. And once you have those NTLM hashes, you can pass them. Now, Microsoft made a big thing maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago about having a pass the hash patch. I think that's what they actually called it, was patch for pass the hash, which scared all those pen testers because pass the hash is dope, and you can use it all the time. You don't even need their password. You don't need to crack anything. You just take this long string of numbers, and it's the equivalent of a password. It's very useful. So there was uh, all these people up in arms like, oh, no, they, they finally got rid of pass the hash, a, a key component in pen testing. Well, it turns out it's actually not that simple. Um, what they did was disable pass the hash for everything other than the RID 500 account. Now, we talked about the RID. Uh, every username is going to have a RID on, an, on the network. The RID 500 is the built-in administrator. Uh, domain users start at 1,000. The RID 500 is always going to stay the same. Now, you can still pass the hash of the RID 500 account, which is like the most important account. I mean, so although you can no longer pass the hash of administrators that aren't built-in administrators, you can still pass it for the RID 500. So if you can dump the NTLM hash database, like you'll get the RID 500. It's just, it's, their patch was, was like neutered from the beginning. I, I don't really get it. Uh, but that's fine. And, uh, what's even more fine is if you have administrative access to these boxes, you can just flip a bit in, uh, flip a switch in the registry and make it so you can pass the hash of all the administrators. That's filter administrator token. We're going to switch that to one. So that's no big deal. Uh, net NTLM version 2 hashes can't be passed. I've already said that like six times. If you want some more information about this, Harmjoy has a blog. It's really tiny. You can't read it. Uh, it's just there for reference. Um, I'll post the slides online after this. Harmjoy has a really cool blog about the pass the hash patch that Microsoft tried to spit out, uh, which details everything about it. But the most important thing is you can still pass the hash. You just can't pass the hash with non-built-in administrator accounts. Here's what NTLM relay kind of looks like. Uh, so the victim there is going to negotiate authentication. You are going to intercept that and pass it along. Now the server is going to send the, the victim a challenge to add to their hash, essentially. Uh, you're going to copy that server challenge over to the victim. The victim is going to sign, authenticate with the signed challenge, and then you're going to pass it over to, the, to the, uh, the server. But here's where you get a little tricky. When the server says, your authentication is good to go, you, the attacker, say, no, no, your authentication is messed up and then you can perform whatever actions you want on the server. So in this case, we're going to want to do things like add administrative users, dump the password database, uh, things like that. So here's actually what the tool does by default through NTLM relay. Once it relays a hash, and that hash, the user of that hash is an administrator on the server that you are relaying it to, it will run several commands. These are the commands. It's going to be hard to see. Uh, First command, it's going to do net user add icebreaker with a set password. And then it's going to add that icebreaker user to the local administrators. So even if everything else fails on the rest of this command, you have administrative access to this box until you don't want it anymore. After that, it's going to do spin up a web server uh, locally on port 443. And then it's going to tell the remote server to download invoke cats.ps1. Invoke cats is an obfuscated meme cats command. Uh, I have added AMSI bypass that I have tested yesterday. It still works well. Uh, AMSI is what Windows Defender uses to like scan memory for PowerShell uh, stuff. So I have an AMSI bypass in there, so Windows Defender is not going to catch it. Uh, it's also obfuscated using 
a tool called Invoke Obfuscation by Daniel Bohannon, I want to say his name is. Uh, awesome tool, really, really cool. You can encode it through ASCII, you can get rid of all the strings. It just completely messes up uh, antivirus defenses. So I have it encoded and I have MSI bypass and I have it uh, local so that you don't even need to have that computer call out to the internet to pull this script down. You just call out to me and it'll run uh, invoke MimiCats. I also changed the core function names for MimiCats. So instead of doing dash dump creds, I think is the original one, you're going to do dash passwords or PWS. Uh, and actually, you're not going to do any of this. The script is going to do all that for you. After it's done, invoke MimiCats. MimiCats is going to scrape all of the passwords and plain text from memory. After it does that, now we're going to download the SAM database. Uh, so we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to have spin up a web server, port 443. We're going to serve invoke power dump. But I've renamed it to invoke passwords, PWS, and obfuscated it and added the AMSI bypass. So this is just going to fly through antivirus. Uh, it's not going to touch disk at all. Uh, and it's going to bypass Windows Defender. Then it runs invoke power dump. So you get all the plain text credentials from memory and you get all the NTLM hashes, which can be as good as a password uh, using invoke power dump. It's going to do all this in a hidden window and using an encoded PowerShell command. So let's talk about attack number five. This is the latest attack. Uh, this is IP version six DNS poisoning. This is cool because Windows networks are vulnerable by default to this. I, I don't know of more beautiful words in the English language than vulnerable by default because Windows networks prefer IP version six. So if you have a Windows network that's not set up for IP version six, you've got a Windows network that's just IP version four, uh, it's going to call your, every computer that connects to that Active Directory environment. It's going to call out and say, hey, what should my IP address be? Uh, where is this web server? And so on and so forth. You can just hijack that using this MITM6 tool because it's going to say, no, this network's actually an IP version 6 network, so ignore everything the administrator set up and listen to me. And it does this attack in a sort of a complex way. Microsoft tried to patch this. So uh, pen testers have used the WPAD file for a long time to get password hashes. WPAD file is Windows proxy auto detection. Whenever you join a uh, domain, your computer is automatically going to go out and search for WPAD dot the domain name or whatever. Now, attackers have taken advantage of this by doing things like spinning up their own WPAD server on the network and forcing it to take NTLM authentication. Then you can get an NTLM hash, a net NTLM hash. Uh, Microsoft patched that, though, so you can't do that anymore. But MIT M6 just kind of skirts around that patch by pretending to be a WPAD server so that whenever a computer tries to connect to the Internet, they will use your computer as a proxy. But instead of asking for authentication immediately, it says there's no authentication. Just go ahead and query whoever you want. So they query Google.com. As soon as I, a man in the middle six gets that query, for an outside website, it says, oh, well, I didn't need authentication to become your WPAD server, but Google needs your authentication in order to visit the site. And of course, the computer just complies because that's Microsoft's way, and it sends the net until I'm hashed to you. So it's a, it's a convenient little workaround to Microsoft's patch of the WPAD uh, attacking issue. Now, the final attack here, oh, I'm sorry, let me mention uh, one more thing, is that when we're doing Attack number five, we're actually running three programs at the same time. We're running NTLM Relay X, we're running IP version, uh, we're running MITM6 to poison the IP version six, and then we're also running Responder to capture the hashes themselves. Uh, all of the configuration files and everything are written by already by the script icebreaker.py, so you don't have to worry about setting anything up. Icebreaker just does everything for you. You just hit enter and you wait. Now the final attack, it's sort of a uh, tongue in cheek, it's attack number six. This is, once you get credentials, once Icebreaker is able to get credentials, uh, attack, fake attack number six is just going to send you straight to domain admin. So Marcello Salvati, uh, one of my best friends and coworkers, wrote a tool called Death Star. Death Star is a tool that hooks into the API of Empire, Empire being like Metasploit, it's like a C2 server, so Empire can go get an agent on a computer, and you're running the Empire server, and then you can run PowerShell scripts on the remote server, like invoke power dump and Nemecats and stuff. So it's just like a Metasploit. Uh, so what Icebreaker does is it kicks off Empire, and it kicks off Death Star, and then Death Star just sits there waiting for a shell from Empire. And as soon as Icebreaker can relay 
a hash from an administrative user to another computer, then it'll automatically run the Empire Launcher agent code on that remote computer. So that means that we get an agent in our Empire shell, in our Empire uh, server, and then Death Star sees that agent and then starts, just automatically kicks off the uh, domain admin acquisition. It automatically does domain recon, it automatically does lateral spread, so it just bounces around computer to computer, dumping credentials from plain text, capturing NTLM hashes until it finds a computer that has a domain admin logged in and you get the domain admin's uh, password. And then it'll just um, keep Empire up for you. So it'll be two windows. Death Star will say, hey, we got domain admin on this shell. And then you can just go over to the Empire window and just interact with that shell. And now you're, you got a domain admin shell on there. Uh, when you cancel Icebreaker, when you close out of Icebreaker, these windows will stay up. So you're not going to lose your sessions to Empire or anything by, by killing Icebreaker. You will keep all of that. Uh, I did give it two options. So in order to run this, you do dash dash auto and either tmux or xterm. Uh, this was because xterm feels, this whole thing is just kind of bolted on as like a, um, uh, a second, like a, a, a fake sixth attack because it would just make my life easier, even though it's not really core functionality of the program, I don't think. So I called it, I have xterm and tmux. xterm does not require any user interaction. So you do dash dash auto space xterm, little xterm windows will pop up, but xterm feels, I don't know, it feels kind of dirty. It's kind of a, Oh, it just looks gross and amateurish. So I also included the tmux option, which requires you to open a new terminal, uh, start up a tmux session, and then uh, this will just use the, t the tmux session instead. That's in case you don't have a graphical interface. Xterm requires a graphical interface, tmux does not. So if you're on a remote device and you're deploying Icebreaker and you want to use this uh, attack, you'll want to use the tmux option so that you don't have to forward X11 and have these ugly windows popping up and stuff. But I'll show you a little demo of what this looks like here. So, we're going to do a live demo, which is never recommended. Uh, I, I didn't sacrifice anything but my sleep. Um, and the problem with live demos is that you have to have a full lab environment in addition to the code, and it's the lab environment that really messes us up sometimes because Windows 8 has an expired license, and you'll notice it's not powered on because it shuts off every hour because it's a trial version. I ran out of uh, rearms. So that was a problem one time. So we're going to let that boot up, and then I am going to kick off Icebreaker, uh, and I'm going to explain a little bit about this lab. We have three machines in the lab. We have Windows Server 2016, we have Windows 10, and we have Windows 8 eventually. Windows 10 has a user on it who is not a local admin. This is Steve. Everybody say hello, Steve. Hi, Steve. You will know, I'm sure you can't read this. Let me see if I can zoom in or something. I can't, so I'll just read it out. Net local group administrators. And we will notice that Steve is not an administrator on this machine. Steve is a regular domain user. Steve is, however, an administrator on Windows 8.1. So we are going to log in first as Bob. Spring 2018, in case anybody's wondering. <laughs> So we're going to log in as Bob here. It, is it summer? Is it? Uh-oh. <laughs> um, and then we're going to log in. We're going to log in as a domain admin here as well. Switch account. Dan.da. Cordy1da. Very secure. Cordy1da, however, is not in the password list, so... All right, and here's what we're going to run. So we have Windows 10 with Steve logged in. Steve is a regular domain user on this box. He is an administrator, however, on Windows 8.1, which also has a domain admin logged in. And whenever a domain admin is logged into a box, you can pull those credentials out of the memory. And you'll notice that uh, we're, uh, Windows, we have the domain admin logged in on Windows 8.1 because by default, Windows 10 does not allow Mimikatz to dump plain text credentials unless you switch... Uh, a registry key. Uh, again, like Microsoft puts in all these fun little uh, security services and then gives you a very easy way of disabling them. Uh, either way, I wanted to make this lab as default as possible. So the only things I have disabled on here, uh, I've actually manually enabled SMB version 1 on Windows 10, and then I don't think I actually had to do anything with Windows SMB signing. I think that was already off. 
So I've, I've made very little changes to this domain. And here's the command we're going to run. We're going to do icebreaker-x, dash x, x being XML. Um, let's see if I can zoom in here. I can definitely zoom in here. I'll just keep zooming. Whatever. Icebreaker uh, dash X means we're going to use XML. So I have already run the end map because, you know, in the interest of time savings. I'm going to skip attack three. Attack three is L uh, responder, L M N R poisoning. You can again, you can skip any of these attacks, uh, one through five. You can have it just do one of them. You can have it do all of them. I'm going to skip attack three just in the interest of time because it, it runs for ten minutes and uh, we'll get the same demo effect out of the uh, attack four and five. And then finally, we're going to give it the dash dash auto X term. So because we're not remoting or SSHing into a remote box, we can use the X term windows uh, and not forward X11 and do all that, that ugly stuff. So we will hit enter. Wait, let me just, let me just confirm everything's here. Okay. We got Steve logged in. We got Windows Server running and everybody is connected. Cool. I think we're good to go. Okay. Parsing hosts. We found SMB open on those hosts. The domain controller was found via a port scan. Jesus, slow down. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to wait one second here. I'm going to wait for Death Star to kick off. So Empire just kicked off because we're already on attack four. It's just blazingly fast. Here's Death Star. Death Star has kicked off. Okay, good. Now let's go back to here and let's scroll up a little bit. I don't even know. We can't scroll up anymore. So, um, Maybe if I zoom out. Oh. There we go. Okay. So we parse the hosts. We have SMB open. We have domain controller found based on the port scan. Uh, we're going to start into attack one, RID cycling, into null SMB sessions uh, into reverse brute force. So first it checks for null SMB, uh, null SMB sessions. Uh, and this is what it's going to do to check for the null SMB session. It's going to use RPC client. So actually some research was done recently that said RPC client can give false negatives when looking for usernames and recycling. Um, so I'm going to replace RPC client with the uh, new Python tools that have come out. Uh, but for right now, this is fine. Uh, username, nothing. So we're using RPC client to connect over SMB to 129. We're not using a username. We're not using a password. And we're just going to execute the LSA query. Uh, that'll give us a little bit of information about the domain. Um, it's really just there to see if we get any information back. And if we get information back, we know we have a null SMB session and we can move on with the attack. So we have a bunch of users found. We got dan.da, dan.win10, Bob, Jay Stickle, and Steve. So we're re reverse brute forcing using spring 2018. Are you sure it's summer? It's only June 1st. All right. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. Um, I could have sworn summer started like June 6th or something. But, uh, anyways. We've got, uh, sp we're doing Spring 2018 and password against, and we're testing these usernames against this one IP address. So this was actually a little bit complicated to figure out how to balance the speed here and the asynchronousity, how to test these usernames against a single IP address and only test them once, but, you know, I've got it worked out. We found the passwords. Found Dan.win10 and we found Bob, who is Spring 2018. Uh, next we're going to do attack two. So these passwords are going to be saved in a file called foundpasswords.txt. And it moves on to attack two. SCF file upload to anonymously writable shares for hash collection. Uh, we found a writable share at pictures. We wrote it. It seemed to have worked. Looking good. Fine. Now we move on. That's a very fast one. That's only going to take like a couple seconds. Uh, we're skipping attack three. We're moving straight to attack four, which is NTLM relay with responder and NTLM relay X. So we started the web server to host the PowerShell payloads for once we relay. Uh, and then we are running Empire and Death Star. Oops. Oh my god. So this long thing is, uh, you'll notice right here, it says dash, dash C, PowerShell, NOP, STA, 1, blah, blah. This is the uh, actual command that's going to get run on the remote system once the relaying has been performed. And it's very long. Uh, then uh, attack five kicks off. We're running MITM6. So at this point, we're running three, three programs, NTLM relay, MITM6, and responder. Uh, we did get a connection, and we did find a password already. That would be uh, John the Ripper. Crack that password. And we'll start. OK, now we'll, we'll go to the actual uh, the fun part here. 
So we, we've already captured a bunch of passwords. Here is Death Star and Empire running. We're going to go over to Windows 10. Now, Windows 10 has Steve in here. Steve, a regular domain user, not an administrator on Windows 10, is an administrator on Windows 8.1. So as Steve, we're going to type net use to connect to a share, and we're just going to put in a fake share. This way, DNS fails, and Steve will fall back to LLMNR, which we can then poison. So we'll hit Enter. Username, lab to Steve. Password, San Diego 7. And it'll say, oh, an error occurred. The password is not correct. Well, shucks. Now you'll notice here, well, you won't notice because I can't zoom in on these, uh, but a new agent was formed right here. We got a new agent uh, in Empire. And as soon as Empire gets the agent, now Death Star is going to take off. I wonder if I can zoom in here. No? No zooming. All right, I'll just, I guess I'll just read it. Uh, M Empire is running under the user Bob. Uh, no, I'm sorry, they had some processes that were found under the user Bob, some processes that were found under dam.da, and now we're PS injecting into the process that the domain administrator is running. And that way, after we PS inject, we can steal their token. Uh, if you steal the token, you have the authority of the domain admin. So that's what Empire, uh, um, Death Star is doing right now. Now, Death Star, there's a major problem, and the problem is Empire. Empire changes all the time. It has only one maintainer, God bless his soul, Chris. Uh, and it's just more bug-ridden today than I think I've ever seen it before. So I have this pegged to a specific version of Empire that I know works, and I have Death Star pegged to the right one, uh, but Empire is constantly changing its options and stuff, so Death Star breaks pretty much with every new Empire release. Um, it's a big problem. It's not a problem here, because I've, I've pegged them to the versions that work, but it'll be a hassle to update those. Um, so what I'm doing actually is running a tool called MSF NetPwn. It's Death Star, but it's for Metasploit, because Metasploit's API hasn't changed in years, and that way I won't have to update that tool like every week. Uh, eventually I'll just incorporate that into this program instead of Death Star and Empire. Uh, Death Star has started lateral movement, started domain privesc. In order to do domain privesc, it checks for the group policy password file. Um, and if there's no group policy password file, then it just does lateral movement and then dumps the credentials and so on and so forth, does the, what's called the credential shuffle. Uh, it'd be cool if we could incorporate Bloodhound into this too. Like if we could get, uh, you can, you can actually download the Bloodhound graph into CSV format, and so I'm looking into a way in MSF NetPwn to either ingest Bloodhound or just do the manual lateral spread technique stuff. So now we're PS injecting. PS injecting means we're injecting into a, a separate process, and then we can steal their token. Uh, another problem with Death Star is that although it's threaded, the threading doesn't really seem to work. So it seems to be a synchronous program, not a concurrent one, which is why this is going to take a really long time. So I'm basically just going to wrap up my presentation, especially since you can't read any of this. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'll answer some questions for the next couple of minutes while this tries to get domain admin. Yeah. How, how noisy is this? This is not a stealth tool. Uh, not a stealth tool, no. This is for when you are dropped in and they know you're there. Um, yeah, so the reverse brute force is going to send off alarms. The SCF file upload is probably the sneakiest of the attacks. Uh, NTLM relay. I don't know how well a antivirus and IDSs handle NTLM Relay. I, I'm, I'm just not sure how well they do that. I don't think that there's a lot of them that are going to alert on that because it's, it's a network-based attack. You'd have to have, I don't know, I'm sure the high-end ones do, but for my intents and purposes, I'm going to say this is not a stealth tool, not a red team tool. Yes? Funny you should ask. Uh, I actually meant to say this a little bit earlier in the presentation. Uh, one thing you may want to do is not run the IP version 6 DNS attack. If you are, uh, okay, so Death Star, that little red thing means Death Star found a domain admin logged in on a system that you have administrative access to, so now it's just a matter of like a couple minutes before it says you have domain admin in the shell. Um, but, so MITM6, MITM6 will poison IP version 6, which Exchange does not like. Exchange despises this, as a matter of fact. 
Um, so if you're trying to stay under the radar, or you, I would recommend just running MITM6 for like a few minutes. So you can run Icebreaker, skip all the attacks until uh, attack four and five, and then just let that run for a couple minutes. And that way, when people get some exchange email connectivity issues, you can just cancel it, uh, and you'll be fine. But if you don't want to mess up the network and you want to eliminate all possibilities of messing up the network, don't use MITM6. Don't uh, skip attack number five. Otherwise, no, it doesn't really cause any problems. Ah, oh, thank you. See, I knew it. I was like, that was a bug already? <laughs> Darn it. Uh, any other questions? Nope. All right, cool. Well, uh, I'm just going to let this run for the next couple minutes, I suppose, because it should pop it in just a minute, even though you can't read a single thing up here. But if there's any other questions, uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or GitHub.